Hopefully you should be able to see my screen. Yes. Okay, uh, so uh, my present, in my presentation, uh, I will try to briefly summarize my recent experience uh, with the uh, application of the deep learning methods for classification uh, in uh, IAOT. Uh, some uh, some issues that I came across, uh, some solutions, and some basic concepts behind it. So in this presentation, uh, I would like to spend first couple of minutes uh, well, uh, describing the concepts and uh, spend a couple of minutes going through a simple example in a Jupyter notebook that I prepared to, uh, to share with you uh, at least two or three parts of the presentation. So for the big beginning, it's just a really uh, short one minute recap of the uh, uh, deep learning that uh, well, what are, uh, how they look like and uh, well, how they can be used in the IOT. So as you can see, well, this is a kind of a general knowledge that uh, comes, with, uh, comes for the deep learning methods that you have some layers, you have imputation la uh, input layer, hidden layers, output layer, uh, in the hidden layers, the uh, the neurons uh, use the inputs uh, and the weights uh, and the uh, and uh, apply activation function in order to get the outputs so, uh, to uh, to learn the weights or to learn the network. The deep learning usually uses the backward propagation algorithm. Uh, usually, the, there is a there is a question about the shallow versus deep learning. So, well, that's a in general, shallow means uh, fewer hidden layers, deep means more hidden layers. We will touch this topic at the end of the presentation. When it comes to the IoT use cases, well, usually IoT is uh, specific in a sense that uh, it has a, a imbalanced data set uh, from the sensor data, sometimes with the uh, missing, data, uh, missing uh, samples and for this couple of the methods can be used to, uh, uh, to overcome these issues. Uh, uh, one of them or some of them are synthetic data generation to fight the imbalance of the data set, outlier detection uh, in case of uh, searching just for specific events or specific issues, imputation of the missing data, and the feature engineering that can be used for a reduction of the feature space as uh, sometimes the sensor data can uh, uh, can have uh, too many features, which could uh, result in the uh, so-called uh, curse of the uh, dimensionality, which is also issue not only for the deep learning but also general in uh, for the machine learning. So to uh, uh, to begin uh, where where each part fits in, so. A uh, simple uh, deep learning classification pipeline consists of just like uh, any other machine learning pipeline, pipeline with feature analysis where we can use the generative uh, adversarial imputation networks, which I will describe in a mo in moment, and then Marin will well, uh, will uh, describe them in the detail uh, in the afternoon. Uh, then for the feature engineering, as I mentioned, uh, we can use also deep learning methods for, for the feature reduction. One of the examples is the use of the autoencoders. Then comes the scaling, just like with any other machine learning method. Uh, scaling is necessary for, uh, for, for improvement of the accuracy and the, and the results. Then we have data, re data set rebalancing. So this means that sometimes the classes are imbalanced and we need to either create uh, the additional data or resample the data. And the uh, classification, which can be binary multi-class, multi-label multi-class, or again, the outlier detection. And there is a one recent topic or one topic that started to be more, uh, I guess, more, more popular in recent couple of years, and that is the measure of the uncertainty of the, uh, of the classification results. So for the, uh, for the uh, missing data, as I mentioned, simple imputation methods usually uh, uh, that are usually used in machine learning are uh, taking the mean, median, most frequent or constant values, then also maybe advanced using the KNN to impute uh, the missing data 
or in case of the deep, uh, deep networks, well, it can be generative adversarial imputation networks. The basic idea is the, uh, uh, of in uh, uh, training two uh, two networks, and there is the generator and discriminator. Uh, as I as I mentioned, Miriam will follow uh, this uh, concept in more detail in the afternoon. But just to have some basic idea, the idea is that you have a, that you train the generator using the real data, uh, create the noise, uh, or use the noise and missing samples, or create the missing samples, add the noise, and uh, 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 send all these on the uh, input of the generator. Then use the mask that uh, that defines the missing samples and use it as a hint matrix for the discriminator, and then uh, simultaneously train both the generator and discriminator. Uh, after after they are trained, well, this discriminator should uh, should be able to discriminate between the real and the fake samples, and the generator should get better in creating uh, fake samples that look like the real samples. For the Finchy feature engineering, uh, again, uh, traditionally it's a PCA polynomial combinations of the, of the features. But in case of the deep learning, autoencoders or variational autoencoders can be used. Uh, difference is that uh, autoencoders uh, uh, encode the data into latent representation and uh, variational autoencoders for the latent distribution. There are three use cases for the autoencoders, maybe more, but three that. Uh, uh, that can be used, in my opinion, for the IIoT. And that is the feature reduction. Uh, so after learning the autoencoder network, which goes from the uh, input, uh, input uh, layer size all the way or narrows it down to uh, less neurons, uh, which uh, uh, which uh, uh, which should or uh, uh, which in, which include the inc uh, encoded data and then again uh, similarly decodes the data uh, and compares the result. This way, the autoencoder tries to or the, uh, trains for the best uh, encoding of the data uh, in a, in a latent space. So it can be used for the feature reduction after training, and also it can be used for the data generation. Uh, from from the latent distribution uh, when you are using the variational autoencoders. As the uh, autoencoder compares the uh, in, uh, input and the output, uh, it can be also used for the alpha outlier detection. If you put uh, on the input the data that was not used for the training or is not usually uh, in the data set. This way it should then, and the autoencoder should uh, output uh, well, uh, I guess uh, it, it should uh, it should output a result that uh, the uh, decoded data doesn't look like the uh, the real data. So for the data rebalancing, again, uh, traditional methods uh, that are used in machine learning include synthetic minority oversampling techniques, which at the end mean uh, random or or well, random oversampling or undersampling uh, of the minor of the majority or minority classes, uh, with some additional uh, additional use cases like or additional tweaks like using of the k-means, borderline, etc. All this can be used in a nice li library that is called the Imbalanced Learned, uh, and it's available for the Python. There are some advanced techniques like the Edison that generate different numbers of the samples based on the class distribution. You can see some examples on the right side that this is the original data set. And after resampling, uh, you have a more data and then therefore you are able to train your classifier uh, to be more accurate. In case of the deep learning, this can be, or oh, there, there are also ensemble methods, which at the end mean that uh, the smooth is incorporated in the uh, in the uh, in the uh, in uh, in the machine learning method that you are trying to use and is uh, as part of it. In case of the uh, uh, deep learning, this can be this can be solved quite least easily by defining a data loader. Uh, with the data loader, you are loading the batches into the uh, neural network, 
and you can define uh, weights for the samples. So in case of the binary classifier, you, uh, you just uh, count the samples in each class or in, also in a, in a multi-class classifier, assign the weights to each sample, and then randomly pick the samples uh, 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 to the batch based on their weight. Uh, this way, uh, you, uh, uh, you have a lesser chance of overfitting and you are using the whole data set compared to uh, the oversampling and undersampling and using the fixed data set as uh, in the previous examples. Synthetic data generation. So uh, again, traditionally, uh, if you know uh, the uh, distribution of your data, then you are fine and you can uh, randomly pick uh, numbers from the given distributions, but this is usually not the case. Uh, so in case you need to generate synthetic data uh, for, to, uh, to, train your, uh, to train your network, uh, one of the methods or two most used uh, uh, Two usually used methods are uh, generative adversarial networks and variational autoencoders that I just uh, described in a, well, in a short, just a couple of minutes ago. When it comes to the generative adversarial networks, uh, again, you are uh, uh, training two networks at once, the generator and the, the discriminator. Uh, the, uh, this is more of a, this is a more general case of the uh, generative uh, adversarial networks for imputation that I described at the beginning. So again, you are using the uh, input data or some uh, random input data, generating the sample and describe, uh, discriminator is comparing the real data with the generator data and calculating an, the loss for the discriminator and the generator. This, this way the generator gets better at creating uh, synthetic uh, samples and discriminator also gets better in the uh, detection. So they are simulating, uh, simultaneously training and getting better. So the generator is able to generate data that is uh, more like the real data that, uh, that you have in the data set. A couple of nice libraries that comes with this. Uh, well, I encourage you to uh, check them yourself. So when it comes to the classification, uh, the uh, well, I guess uh, the uh, uh, the issue that I came across and uh, was unable to uh, find a good solution to is how should I or how should one uh, uh, define the network and what kind of layers uh, should I use? How many layers? Uh, how many neurons per layer, etc. There are no uh, general. I guess the most often the answer that you will find uh, in any forum or in any literature is that based on your data set, you should uh, design something uh, that, uh, that could be used for the classification, which is, in my opinion, uh, not really helpful. Uh, so I try to sum up a couple of the advices that I was able to find in the literature. One of them is that, well, uh, mathematically, one layer uh, should be enough to have the universal approximator, but at the same time, it's not really effective and it can, uh, uh, it can take too long to learn. So that's, uh, that's why the deep learning or uh, more hidden layers comes in the role, as the depth increases the uh, generalization and also can speed up uh, the training process. Also, too few uh, neurons can create uh, uh, additional issues like underfitting, and too many can create overfitting, which we will hopefully see in a, in a minute in an example. So number of the hidden layers. Again, uh, well, uh, there are a couple of advices that you can find in the, in the literature that how many hidden layers should you use? Uh, the, the, well, one should be enough Two, two should be enough for, uh, for every case, but then at the same time, the more layers sometimes can help you uh, create more general uh, solution. A couple of uh, rules of thumb that, uh, that I was able to find in the book, Introduction to Neural Networks, and there that the, the, uh, the, the size of the input layer, uh, that the, uh, 
a number of the neurons should be between the two thirds of the input layer and the output layer. It should be between the uh, uh, size of the input layer and the output layer, uh, or shouldn't be uh, uh, larger than twice of the input layer. Again, this is more of a trial and error issue. There are, there are many parameters that you can uh, that you can tune up for, for the uh, uh, for the deep net. Two important ones are learning rate and the batch size. Again, uh, there are no good rules of what you should use uh, or uh, what kind of value you should use. Uh, when it comes to the batch sizes, if you, uh, if you use the whole training set, uh, then it will converge really slowly. If you are uh, using the one, then you are uh, one sample at a time, you are doing at the end stochastic ready and decent. If you are using mini batches, Again, that's a additional parameter that you need to define, but it can uh, give you be better results. When it comes to the learning rate, there are a couple of rules of thumb that people usually uh, go for that to use uh, some values in between 0 0.01 and 0 0.1, etc. There are of course also other other values that uh, or other parameters that you could, that you can tweak uh, depend, depending on the optimizer that you are using, like a momentum, weight decay, etc. Uh, there is also a specific topic when it comes to uh, the design of the networks that is the pruning, and there are a couple of uh, ways how to deal with it. It's either incremental or selective pruning. The whole idea is that you look at your network uh, uh, after the training process. And then you start to eliminate either the, uh, the network, either the connections or the neural or the ne neurons in order to make uh, better results, in order to make it more effective. And it may be uh, to, uh, uh, to, uh, to deal uh, with the overfitting or underfitting of, of the data. There also uh, there is also a plethora of the optimizers that you can use. I think that there is uh, about uh, ten or fifteen in the PyTorch. Uh, the most uh, uh, usual ones are the SGD Adam, but there are also other variations uh, of them and the uh, learning rate schedulers. Again, there are also search thread strategies that you can use. There is a random search to randomly picking the parameters. You can do the grid search. You can do you can do the exhaustive search and do all kinds of uh, combinations. So again, this is not really helpful when you are trying to design some base, basic neural network. And there are also uh, different layers that you can use for, for either drop, drop out for uh, and overfitting normalizations on uh, layers for, to stabilize or speed up uh, different activation functions, the most popular row or leaky row. So uh, the problem is uh, then, or so we will get to it in the example. So the problem is that how should you then define the network? But uh, just before we get to it, there is a one last topic that I would like to touch and it is the uh, classification uncertainty. So uh, usually we, uh, we train the network to classify uh, on a limited number of the classes. So, but what, what happens if you receive or if the network receives the sample that was that is out of the, uh, the data set that you were, or out of the distribution of the data set that you, that you use for the training or the testing. Is, uh, so the idea is to train the network to say, I don't know. So the, uh, uh, so the, uh, this comes with uh, two types of uncertainty that you can have. The, uh, one of them, or well, first one is aleatoric, that's the uh, certainty or uncertainty in your data. So as you can see in the example of, from the paper, uh, I think it's, uh, it's from, uh, from the first paper reviews of uncertainty quantification. The data uh, can be, uh, uh, well, uh, maybe you are trying to approximate some function and the data is somewhere uh, around it, but it's, uh, but uh, there is a bit of a noise uh, uh, in the data, and this is the this is the uncertainty in the data that you can't really reduce. But then there is epistemic uh, or the knowledge uh, uncertainty, and that comes with the model. So, but how you can measure it? Uh, so, how you can measure it? There are a couple of different ways. One of them is the Bayesian deep learning, uh, 
the idea is that you are not uh, training the uh, exact values of the weights for the neurons, but you are training the distributions. Then there are Monte Carlo methods. So that's a, uh, uh, they use uh, dropout layers in order to drop out the neurons. And then there are also a couple of different methods that use uh, the regular uh, distributions in salt, instead of the softmax probabilities at the output layer. And the result is that as you can see in this paper from uh, sensor, uh, um, sensor Murat, I guess. Uh, but it's a nice example that uh, it's showing that uh, when the uh, uh, digit uh, uh, number one is being rotated, the, the neural network uh, starts to predict at first uh, number one, then three, seven, eight, four, five, uh, five, eight, one. So, but if you train it to, uh, to say, I don't know, or if you train it for an uncertainty, then after uh, some degree, I think it's like about uh, 50 degrees, it is able to say that even though it's giving output three, it's still able to say that he uh, that the network doesn't know uh, the answer for for sure. So uh, about the example and how to design your neural network. So I would like like to uh, uh, make a, a short example in the Jupyter notebook with some code that I'm uh, that I was using in the last couple of months. So hopefully, well, hopefully it it will it will work. So to give you some uh, some basic idea of what I was talking about about the design of the networks, this is a simple no notebook that I created. Uh, this is one also one of the issues that I came across that in PyTorch, uh, if you are using uh, or if you are working on machines that have uh, thirty or more CPUs, like on, on, on different servers, it's uh, it's underutilizing the system. And well, it took me some time to figure it out, but by by default. PyTorch uses just half of the processors uh, for the computation, so you can uh, set it yourself for more. Uh, in this ex example, I'm just using a, a really simple, tiny data set uh, that, uh, uh, that, that that's available at uh, UCI. It's quite old uh, data set, but as it's tiny, it's uh, it's nicely use, usable for the examples. The data set consists of uh, 57 features and the labels are just zero and one. So that's like spam or non-spam email. So it's a simple binary classification problem. As you can see, uh, the, uh, the data set by itself is already imbalanced a bit. So there is a, a less spam emails than non-spam emails. Uh, these are just some, um, some basic uh, 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 basic machine learning tasks. So I'm just uh, uh, dividing the data set into training and testing, uh, just scaling the data set. And this is, uh, so now I need to define some, some basic structure of the uh, network that, that I'm going to use that, uh, let's say, or I can keep, keep it on five, that how many hidden layers I'm going to uh, have in the network uh, well, as I don't have a GPU, then uh, my only choice is a CPU, some basic parameters like the batch size. The higher the batch size, the faster the network will, will be calculated. Also, this is an important parameter when it comes to using the GPUs because uh, the, the power of the GPU can be seen when you are using the large, large matrices as, they, as the GPU uh, is much faster in computing them compared to the CPUs. This is a function that uh, uh, that I have in my own uh, uh, repository, and at the end, it creates uh, a network that will have uh, in, uh, input layer, one hidden layer, and one uh, one uh, output layer with a sigmoid function to decide if it's a spam or non-spam. So when it comes to the rebalancing of the data set, as I mentioned to you, uh, the data set is already in balance. That, that there is a uh, there are less uh, spam emails than no spam emails. So to give you some idea that what it means uh, uh, for the accuracy, uh, first I will just already train, it should go quite fast uh, without rebalancing it. So as you can see, uh, well, this, uh, this uh, uh, function gives me output of the loss function. 
and uh, there are some metrics, for example, the accuracy for the zero and for, or for the non-spam class and spam class. And as you can see, uh, it's, it's nicely, if, uh, the, the accuracy is being increased for the uh, non-spam class, which has more samples, but the spam class, well, it actually goes down. So we can easily, well, we can easily see uh, this when we take the accuracy, this is the average accuracy, accuracy between uh, these two, two classes. So if we do the same and rebalance the data set, just like I mentioned to you before, by returning the samples and, and, and uh, resampling the data set inside the Python Torch code, it should hopefully give you better, better results. So as you can see, uh, the accuracy for the, uh, for the spam uh, data set is increasing. So even though at the, uh, at the beginning um, uh, it was quite low, but thanks to resampling or, and uh, dealing with the imbalance in the data set by resampling the data uh, for the patches, the accuracy is great, gradually increases with some, I guess, minor flaws. And there is a one last thing that I would like to share with you. And that is, or oh, maybe uh, two things for which I already ran the code. So as you can see, uh, the uh, detection of the spam goes up even to 70 or 80%. And this is just a random, uh, uh, random network design. So in the visualization, you can see that uh, it uh, gradually goes up. Uh, this is just a classification report uh, that uh, well, will give me uh, the final results. So when it comes to the parameter tuning that I mentioned to you, that uh, it, is a, it is a problem to, to decide how many layers and what sizes of the layers uh, you should have in your network. So I designed, or well, well, for this uh, example, I created a couple of different designs uh, and I would like to show you the results. So the idea is that uh, I created designs that have these kind of shapes that the neural network has a constant hidden layers that it increases, constant decreases the, uh, the, uh, uh, the number of the neurons in the hidden layers, uh, antitrapezoid decreases, stays, increases and goes to the result, uh, et cetera. There's a funnel design that it goes from, well, the input layer all the way to, uh, all the, way to the result. And the number of the uh, hidden layers are just, as you can see here, three, five, seven, nine, eleven. This, uh, uh, these are just some numbers that I picked up, uh, so that uh, so the networks can be uh, uh, can be symmetrical. I already trained the networks uh, using the. Uh, uh, using the grid, grid search and uh, and I would li like to rather present you the results. So when you look at the, the uh, different uh, different different network designs, you can see that well in the in the legend it says the number of the hidden layers. So when you look at uh, for example, I guess the funnel design is uh, easiest to to understand that if you have a simple funnel design, so you are going from at the uh, input or the size of the input layer to, uh, to the last uh, neuron, which is just one, and you have three layers, you are getting a much better results than, you, than if, you, uh, are, if, if you would have, if you would use 11 hidden layers. Uh, uh, this code, uh, and also there's a difference between uh, these numbers that you can sometimes see in some of these examples that three layers uh, uh, perform a bit worse than the five layers. Also, um, there is a different accuracy depending on the uh, design that you want to choose. Uh, in this case, you can see that after uh, some, some number of the hidden layers, like nine or 11, uh, they are not really improving at all. So it 
seems that it makes more sense to use just fewer of the layers. So this way you can do a grid search uh, and define the hidden layers or a number of the hidden layers and, and their size. And when it comes to, uh, to the parameter tuning, this, uh, this is a simple implementation of the base optimization that uh, it's, a, uh, it's a library that you can find uh, uh, and uh, uh, is easily install. Uh, the idea is that you uh, create objective function, you uh, create some basic design, and you are searching for the best parameters for the given function. So you set the batch size. It will be the batch size that you are expecting should be that should work. It will be between let's say 100 and 1,000. Number of epochs, number of learning rate, and for the base optimization process, you just define that how many initial points uh, uh, should the process try. Let's say three, and depending on the results. Uh, how many iteration it should do uh, in order to find the best combination of the results. And when I run it, so as you can see that uh, it's uh, doing the uh, uh, initial three points, uh, it finds out that the accuracy was best for number of epochs three, batch size uh, 267, and the learning rate is 0 0.04. And uh, well, then it proceeds to try to find um, better, um, better combination of the parameters. And with this, I would like to end the presentation. Thank you for listening. So if anybody has any questions, well, um, happy to answer. I hope I didn't, well, I think I went over two minutes, so it should be still quite okay. Yeah, it's okay, Pavel. Thank you very much. Very nice presentation. And just to complement here what Hirley said in the beginning, so we've been actually working for a bit over the year in Fireman, but officially as a full member very early. So and you were like one of the key presenters in the first year workshop and you are here in the second one as official member. So very good yeah. and, and thanks and very nice presentation and, and, and contribution. So anyone Thank you. Has, Thank yeah. you. Happy to be here. Yeah, thanks for all. So anyone has any question? Don't um, be shy, people. <laughs> Pedro, this is uh, Shubham and uh... I have a question for Pablo here. Oh. Uh, so, hi, Pablo. Uh, thank you for a nice presentation. And uh, I am working more in the area of powertronics where artificial intelligence or data driven approaches can be used. So, as I'm working more on the cybersecurity part, so I'm usually complaining about using any data driven approaches because, like you discussed, uh, the uncertainty. Uh, as you described here, could be noise, but this could also be intended uh, bad data in the in the data set. So, how do you think uh, we will be able to eliminate or at least find out that there are some bad data, which has been intentionally put into the data set to come up with a compromised uh, system? So, do you have any views here? Yeah, we'll start uh, well, me, uh, maybe with. Uh... Well, I guess there are two approaches, and it depends that which one gives better results. And that is the uh, look at the uh, look at the data as on the outliers and use maybe uh, some type of the autoencoders. I, I described only the basic uh, a basic one, but if you go on a GitHub, there is a there is a plethora of different different uh, well tweaks and adjustment adjustments uh, to the autoencoders, so you can treat the uh, attack or uh, intentionally uh, bad data as a you know uh, as an outlier, and or you can uh, look at it as a uh, as an uncertainty problem that if uh, if the neural network receives uh, the data that it's too uncertain about, like the example with with a with a digit then uh, you can set the threshold that if the uncertainty is above some level uh, or if it's well okay ideally uh, ideally it's a uh, one then uh, 
uh, you can raise alarm or something like that, that uh, you are suspecting some, you know, some attack or something. Yeah, actually, I have been, uh, you know, looking into these solutions as well. In Powertronix, the time to respond to any of this uncertainty is really less. We are talking about milliseconds here. So by the time we realize that there is an uncertainty or anything like that, uh, you know, the system has already taken the action. So the time limit also um, puts this limitation of identifying the uncertainty. So we really need uh, like a, I would say filtering tool before training to come up with uh, just a data assessment. Uh, yeah, but, uh, but, yeah, but you are predicting this uncertainty on already trained networks. So uh, uh, even though it's a milliseconds, then uh, you are uh, you know you are only forwarding the data through the network. So that's a that's a subsequent uh, operation. So of course the training would take a lot of time, but you do the training before that, right? So you train the network and and then when you use it in a in a production, then it's a subsequent response. Okay, yeah, I got it now. Yes, thank you so much. Thanks, Hans. Thanks, Pavel. So, one more question, last question before we had our our break. So, maybe I can have one. Uh, uh, let's say quick question. That's not really a question, but uh, Pavel, do you see? Uh, what you have presented uh, 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 combined with Alex presented before you, you have, can you try to, because it was very uh, one uh, quick presentation by him, but still, can you see any ways that those two things are, are, are can be related? Yeah, I think that, uh, that Alex mentioned a couple of places where uh, some uh, uh, deep learning uh, uh, deep nets uh, can be plugged in. I just uh, can't recall it from the top of my head, but I noticed that he mentioned it at uh, some places that uh, either that or as a you know uh, uh, as a possible approach for for comparison that well what can give better, better results. So. I guess that there's always a way to com combine different methods that either combine them or show uh, the different uh, the difference by evaluation that which one is better. Yes, very good and, and challenge one. So I, I just see if you were paying attention in the previous one. <laughs> so good, Favol. <laughs> so thanks. And uh, I think you can have a break. I don't know, Hirley may, may propose. So should you have like a... Uh, half an hour breaker can have 15 minutes and come back at two and keep the same schedule so what do you think here like hello uh, hello pedro uh, this is stefano can you hear me yes stefano yeah for me it's fine you can also anticipate to a fast one it, it is fine for me okay so let's see what here they what do you think here they are fine uh... Maybe you can you can have like a let's say fifteen minutes or like a around ten minutes break and then you can return around two and then you can start the presentation with Stefano at two. Sounds good. To uh, me. I can actually present at half past one. It is, it is even better for me if, if you if you if, you, if this is possible. Oh no! It, 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 because you are in Finnish time, so that's the reason for you. That <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, Sorry. like a, for for you is like a, I think you are in the like it is twelve forty five for you. For us is one third one forty five. So okay, so we are going to have a break of uh, ten minutes. Ten minutes, yes, oh, and then then you can present. Is it okay? okay? Yeah, that's fine. That's fine. Okay, yeah, that's sorry, 